Silent Hill, a series that changed not only the horror landscape moving forward, but raised the bar for psychological storytelling for a long time. Its consistent terror permeates through each game, electing to deliver a persistent fear rather than shocks and jumps. Today, we'll be talking about the first game in the series, an experience which still holds up to this day, delivering the same terror and atmosphere that it did over 20 years ago. Over the next videos, I'll be diving deep into every Silent Hill game, the good and the bad. We'll see the rise of the series over time and find out what about it changed the gaming landscape for the better. We'll also see its dissolution and the downfall of a video game giant. Today, we're going to delve into the depths of the first game, talking about gameplay, story, mechanics, development, and everything in between. For this video, I played Silent Hill on a PlayStation 1 emulator on account of physical copies costing just a little bit of money. Hey dad, it's me, your favorite son, and today I want to talk about Silent Hill. Development of Silent Hill began in September 1996 at Konami. The group working on it was named Team Silent. Supposedly, they were made up of developers who had failed at other projects within Konami, but this claim can't really be confirmed. I'd heard this for years, but when I actually tried to source it, I found nothing, so it's myth for now. Konami wanted to make a game that would be successful in the American markets. During development, Konami lost faith in the project, and this may have led to the game's success in the end. The team was allowed more artistic freedom because of this and were allowed to go in a direction that focused on the player's emotions. The game's director, Kaichiro Toyama, was not confident in his abilities as he had never taken this role before Silent Hill. A lot of Toyama's influences for the game resulted from his experience with UFOs, the occult, and David Lynch movies. The town itself was based off of the team's experiences with Western literature and films. Artist Takayoshi Sato had a large influence on the game's development, though he started out doing simple tasks like font design and file sorting. He created presentations and taught staff members 3D modeling, but was not given respect from the older members of Konami, even though he was more proficient than them. Sato had to step over his boss to show his prowess with 3D, and eventually got the chance to do most of the 3D work on the game. He was still being overseen by a supervisor and wasn't being given the credit for his work. His boss at Konami challenged him to do everything on his own, and he took it. Not many people believe that I did it myself, and it wasn't like I wanted to make it all from scratch. I just had to do it in order to get credit. Plus, you don't want to be credited in your game as assistant artist if you did everything. Sato ended up having to sleep in the office under his desk and use all 150 computers when everyone went home to get renders done. Sato also stated that the game had a very low budget, and the team was aiming to make a masterpiece rather than a sales game, a story that would persist over time. The soundtrack for the game was composed by sound director Akira Yamaoka. He joined the team after the original musician had left. He was also responsible for all of the sound design in the game and said that the job would have normally taken six to eight people, but he was really the only person who touched it. He purposefully did not want to watch scenes from the game, trying to create the music independently from the visuals. He was influenced by Angelo Badalamenti, the composer of Twin Peaks. Yameoka wanted to create an industrial feel, cold and rusty, and when sharing the pieces with the staff members, they misinterpreted some of the sound as a bug. Silent Hill was released for the Sony PlayStation on February 23rd, 1999. Before we get into the game, I'd like to lay out how I'm going to talk about most of the Silent Hill games. The story of Silent Hill was designed to be slightly ambiguous, its meaning hidden underneath, and not available to everyone right away. To discover the secrets of the plot, the player would need to pick apart every piece of information available to them, and only then would they have the full narrative at their disposal. 
Because of this, playing the game for the first time can feel confusing to some, as you're experiencing the game at a surface level. For these videos, I will first talk about the game, my analysis of the mechanics, taking you through the experience as I normally do. I'll only explain the story at its surface level, and afterwards, I'll go back, recounting the true story of what happened, and my analysis of said events. This will accomplish two things. One, this will allow the viewer who wants to find out the true story for themselves to watch some of the video and not be entirely spoiled. If my essay is as persuasive as I'd like, by the end of the first section, you might want to go play it for yourself anyways. The second thing it will provide is the narrative from the perspective of our main character, Harry. The first perspective will be a particularly in-world view of the game, and the second a more analytical view. These game's stories are incredibly up to interpretation, and there are tons of different ones out there that are still debated to this day. So I'm really only going to go into the generally accepted view of events. Just know, there will still be spoilers throughout the whole video, but if you want to avoid double spoilers, skip the real story section. With that being said, let's get into the game. Silent Hill opens with a compilation of renders, backtracked by the Silent Hill theme, a composition with unsettling and ringing strings of a mandolin. We see many different scenes and characters that we'll encounter over the course of the game, foreign to us for now. Our main character, Harry Mason, wakes up in his car, crashed in the town of Silent Hill. We're briefly thrust into an unfamiliar atmosphere, the streets of the town. Before we get to that, Harry is looking for his daughter, Cheryl. He sees her off in the distance, past the fog, but she disappears again. We chase her down an alley, the place covered in blood and the remains of something. It begins to get darker and our way is only lit by a lighter. Broken wheelchairs, bodies on stretchers, and sirens assail us through our surroundings. Finally, Harry's environment turns warped, and he finds a grotesque body hung on the wall. Two monsters come from the shadows using weapons to kill Harry. Harry wakes up on a bench inside a cafe, the events presumably a dream. A policewoman is waiting for him, she introduces herself as Sybil Bennett. Harry reveals that he came to Silent Hill for a vacation with his daughter, Cheryl. Sybil says she hasn't seen her or anyone except Harry. Where is everybody? I'd tell you if I knew, believe me. But from what I can tell, Something bizarre is going on. Sybil is from the next town over and she wants to go back to call in reinforcements, but Harry is going to stay to find Cheryl. Sybil gives him a gun to protect himself. Harry finds a map, some equipment, and a radio before an air screamer launches through the window and we have to shoot it. Now we're given free reign of the town. Silent Hill's gameplay is very much of its time. We should get this out of the way in the beginning because it's the thing people always talk about when playing Silent Hill for the first time, the tank controls. If you don't know what tank controls are, they're just that. You control your character by pressing the up and down buttons to move forward or backward and the left and right buttons to turn. This can be incredibly jarring for some people who aren't familiar with them. And I'll admit, it's been a while since I've used tank controls. It was a little cumbersome at first, but I got used to them pretty quickly. You're probably wondering, Son, what's the advantage of tank controls if they're so awkward to use? That'd be a good question, because tank controls aren't just a limitation of the hardware at the time. They actually work incredibly well in something like Silent Hill. This game's number one goal is fear. The general atmosphere and the terror that that atmosphere generates in the player is one of the things it does best. This tension is created by a combination of cinematic shots, biting music, and the world's design. The cinematic portion of that is relevant to what we're talking about here. Often when walking down a hallway or going through a room, the camera may shift, throwing your perception of the world into a jarred, off-kilter angle. 
This does well for overall presentation, making the game look more interesting, but it's also a reflection of the horror that the world presents. Silent Hill isn't a normal place, it's off-center. It's looking down from the corner of an alley, not following your character over their shoulder. The tank controls help with this. When angles shift drastically, we can continue to control the character without having to adjust controls. It takes some getting used to, but it's worth it. We've been given a gun by Sybil, and shooting is pretty simple in this game. Ammo is not unlimited, it must be found and picked up around the world. Holding R2 will aim your weapon and pressing X will attack. This works the same for ranged and melee. Turning while aiming will reposition yourself to fine-tune your aim. Fortunately, Harry kind of makes up for a lot of the human error in our aim, so it's not too difficult to hit targets. We can also strafe by using the R1 and L1 buttons. Now that we're outside, we're introduced to the town proper. Silent Hill is abandoned. We don't know where all of the people have gone, but there's no one to be found. Yet. A thick fog covers the entire place. This was a clever way that Team Silent found to get around the limitations of the PlayStation. It also has the added effect of making the character feel alone and terrified. We have our trusty radio though, which will alert us with a static sound when enemies are nearby. Both of these things, the world and the gameplay mechanic of the radio, have extremely similar goals, to give you functionality while also creating an atmosphere that feels unsettling. Hearing the radio start to crackle as you're running through the town makes you feel like something is out there, waiting. And that's because it is. You just don't know from where or what it is. This is where the true horror of this game lies, the psychological, the implied fear. The game isn't here to jump out at you, but it's also not here to play along with you. It's here to trick you. It wants to play on your fears and use them against you, and it does it to a masterful degree. Harry needs to find Cheryl though, and that's what this really comes down to. We have a trusty map that we can access through our menu or with the triangle button. Harry will mark things on the map for us, 2B destinations, roads that are blocked off, or doors that are locked. It's a useful tool, but since the entire town is obscured, you feel like you're finding things on your own, and there's a lot to explore. But we need to head back to the alley that we were in during the dream sequence. Now, it's not as monster-infested as before, or dark, and there's a large lack of suspended nasty body on the wall. At the end of the alley, Harry finds a note ripped from Cheryl's notebook that says, To School. He also finds her notebook on the ground, a picture of Harry drawn by Cheryl on the cover. We also gain a steel pipe, our second melee item of the game. The first was the knife that we obtained in the cafe, but the steel pipe is a large upgrade from that. Melee weapons are a must-have because the monsters of Silent Hill will attack, and like I said, ammo is limited. We don't want to run around using it all up. Melee combat, though, is not as easily mastered as the shooting. It requires timing and accurate placing. You never want to be outside too long. Not only are the roads filled with the atmosphere that I detailed earlier, a soundtrack that switches and changes, things that bump in the night, but there's a lot of enemies to be wary of. The two main ones that we'll encounter on the streets for now are the Air Screamers and the Groaners. Air Screamers are pterodactyl-like creatures that swoop out of the air and chase you down. They're pretty fast and the best way to take them down is the gun. But you don't have to kill everything in this game. In fact, outside of bosses, there's only one enemy you have to kill to complete the game, so it's never shameful to just run. But the Air Screamers can catch up to you, so learning to juke them is vital. The Groaners are fleshy, hairless dogs that lunge and bite. They're quick, and timing your melee attacks properly is very important. Both of these enemies are pretty weak compared to what we'll be facing later in the game, but they definitely set the stage. When you're trying to run away, maybe ducking quickly into an alley to grab some bullets and getting out, it can be an intense experience. 
You can hear the flapping of wings behind you and biting of the groaners. But you have to just keep pressing forward, heart thumping in your chest. We have to head to the Midwich Elementary School next, but our path is blocked off. Some of the roads are obstructed or completely gone in the town. To do this, we have to get through a house on Levin Street, and we need three keys that we'll find around the town. Once we step into the backyard, the sky goes black and it's dark again. The town no longer obscured by the fog, but the lack of light. Luckily, we have a flashlight we can use to reveal a small area in front of us. Harry gets to the elementary school and heads inside. Midwich Elementary School was based on the school in the movie Kindergarten Cop. This is most likely because the designers wanted a Western film to base their school off of. Here, we're introduced to another of Silent Hill's largest gameplay elements, puzzles. Silent Hill's puzzles are, for the most part, interesting and challenging. They require exploration, thought, and most importantly, trial and error. Silent Hill has a very simple inventory system. Pick things up and you'll carry them. It's not limited in any way and you can navigate through your menu to use them on objects around the town. Our first puzzle of the game has us finding two relics, a sun talisman and a moon talisman, to place in the clock tower. Our biggest hint is the book behind the counter at the front of the school. This has riddles associated with each time that the clock will show. The first riddle we need to solve is the golden hand. Harry finds a chemical in one of the rooms and uses it to dissolve the hand holding the first talisman. The second talisman can be solved by playing certain keys on this piano, and the riddle associated with it is actually pretty interesting. We have descriptions of bird flying patterns, and these all relate to specific keys on the piano. The black birds correspond to black keys that need to be played, and the same for white. There are clues in each of the lines that relate to position of the keys, like the dove flying far beyond the pelican, which means that this key is far from the previous one. We narrow the amount of keys down a bit by only needing to press the silent ones in the piano. This puzzle takes a ton of trial and error, and really requires taking the time to think things over and rule out which keys do or don't need to be pressed. I was starting to go a little insane, but once I finally got it, it was incredibly satisfying. After that talisman is placed, we can head inside the clock. Now, the school has a certain atmosphere to it just like the town. We encounter a new enemy here, or rather, one we've seen before. It's the Grey Children, or demon kids that Harry was attacked by in his dream. They will slash at us and are the first enemies that will actually hold Harry in place. They can be pretty annoying, but are avoided pretty easily. The entire school, though, has a theme track filled with the bassy, open sounds of a clock and these rusty synths that give an incredibly unnerving ambiance. You always feel like something is around the corner or about to pop out at you. But when you go through the clock, you crawl out on the other side and come out of that same clock, but different. We're in the same courtyard, but there's a large seal on the ground, some occult-like symbol painted on the concrete. Entering the halls, we realize that we're in an incredibly changed version of the school. The floors are all grating now, and the atmosphere has been pumped up to 11. We'll encounter quite a few alternate versions of the areas in Silent Hill throughout the game, and they just work so well. As you're wandering the halls of the terrifying and unnerving school, you don't think that it can get any scarier, but the alternate version always bumps it up. If the regular world feels like a dream, then the other world surely feels like a nightmare. We have to solve another puzzle to unlock the next area. We need to get down to the boiler room, but the layout of the building has changed slightly. Certain doors are locked that weren't on the other side. If we grab a picture card, we can travel into one of the hallways and head into the bathroom. 
This other world is so warped that entering the women's bathroom will transport us to the second floor. Here, we get a new ranged weapon, the shotgun. The shotgun does a lot of damage and works most effectively when in close range. I mostly reserve to use it for bosses, though. We grab a rubber ball on the first floor and find a phone in one of the teacher's rooms. The phone rings and it's Cheryl on the other end. Cheryl! Once we reach the rooftop, Harry finds a key that's stuck down one of the drain pipes. We can use the rubber ball from earlier to plug the hole that's draining the water, causing the keys to be washed down to the courtyard. This will give us access to the basement. Here, we solve a simple puzzle by turning the valves, and we're into our first boss fight. So, I'll be honest, the first time I fought this boss, I beat it so fast I didn't even realize what was happening. There is a hint earlier in the school that alludes to this boss's weakness. It tells the story of a hunter fighting a giant lizard and shooting an arrow into its open mouth. That's what we're supposed to do with the split head. He comes at us quite slowly, and eventually when he opens his mouth, we can unload shotgun shells into him to kill him. We hear a siren and things go fuzzy before Harry wakes up in the boiler room, seeing an image of a girl fading away as he awakes. He thinks this might have been another dream, and we pick up the K. Gordon key off the ground before leaving the school. We can hear church bells in the distance. The creature designs in this game aren't anything particularly amazing outside of the bosses. I think that the split head, for example, looks very eerie, and there's something particularly Japanese-influenced about the characteristics. The normal creatures, though, are good. They're definitely terrifying, but I think this was just the beginning for the creature designs for Team Silent. I think that they would truly find their stride in that realm with later titles. The key allows us access into the back door of a house off of Levin Street. This allows us to head to the church, looking for the source of the bells. When Harry arrives, he meets a woman who speaks very cryptically. There are a ton of occult references in Silent Hill. As I said before, Toyama was interested in the occult and used information from that to influence the cults in Silent Hill. I've tried to make a concerted effort to find the origins of most of these terms because, for the most part, the terms and references used have origins in real-world religions, occults, or mysticism in general. I've been expecting you. It was foretold by gyromancy. This is a method of divination that is completed by placing glyphs on the ground and running in a circle, using the fall as a method of prophecy. Dahlia seems to know about Cheryl, as she knows that we want the girl. Nothing is to be gained from floundering about at random. You must follow the path. The path of the hermit concealed by Flowros. This is possibly a reference to the tarot card of the same name, or just the general reference to the hermit, cutting ties with society and physical life to get closer to ascension. She says that this path is concealed by Floros. Here, the Floros, a cage of peace. It can break through the walls of darkness and counteract the wrath of the underworld. She gives us some literal advice and tells us to head to the hospital and leaves the church. Dahlia gives us the Floros, a triangular object of power that will help us in our future endeavors, and a drawbridge key. Floros is a duke-ranked demon, or lesser demon, in the ranking of the Ars Goetia, a subsection of the Lesser Key of Solomon. This is a grimoire on demonology and an ancient occult writing. Floros is said to have 36 legions of demons and will give true answers of past, present, and future. He must be trapped in a magic triangle, otherwise he will deceive the conjurer. We head over and lower the drawbridge, opening up a completely new area of the town, the shopping district. I haven't really talked about it too much, but Silent Hill is pretty open. A lot of the areas you'll explore don't really have anything in them. 
This is to be expected, but it's pretty impressive just how much you can explore in an over 20 year old game. When you do find things though, you'll be grateful because venturing outside of the linear path will reward you with extra bullets or healing items, which always come in handy. But it's a risk reward type of situation because exploring more than necessary always involves getting into more scraps with the monsters of Silent Hill, which can be stressful and anxiety inducing. This is the thesis that Team Silent were talking about before. They wanted to play on people's fears. Overcoming those fears and pushing past them is rewarded with extra items. We encounter a new enemy type in the shopping district, which was, for me, one of the most unnerving ones I encountered. They kind of look like gray, furless gorillas. They jump around on their hands and will pin Harry down, attacking him. The worst part is the sound they make, though. They have this odd groan that's quite unsettling, especially when you're running away from a couple of them. We head to the hospital and inside Harry sees a man that's just killed one of the monsters. The man shoots at Harry before realizing he's a human. Thank God, another human being. Do you work here? I'm Dr. Michael Kaufman. I work at this hospital. He introduces himself as Dr. Michael Kaufman, the hospital director. Kaufman leaves shortly after this, saying he can't sit around and do nothing. Exploring the hospital, it's entirely empty, just like everything else, but there aren't even enemies here, like the school. We find a basement key and a strange puddle in the director's office, which, of course, we put into a water bottle for later. This strange bottle of liquid is integral in getting the best ending for the game. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention that Silent Hill has four endings, technically five. We'll get to those in due time. For now, just know that we're going to be talking about the good plus ending first. Harry heads to the basement and restores the power, activating the elevator. This allows us to access the building's three floors, but the doors to them are all locked. When we step back in the elevator off the third floor, there's a new button for the building's hidden fourth floor. We see the girl from the school's boiler room walking away as we exit the elevator, and we're now in the Otherworld Hospital. This whole place is just as terrifying as the alternate school. Its fleshy doors and rust-covered walls invoke panic and terror. Its new enemies, the puppet nurses and doctors, inspire quite a bit of fear as well. They're one of the better enemy designs in the game. They stay looking down, twisting and contorting their bodies as they rush at Harry with knives. Later games would expand upon this nurse concept and do it much more justice, but these still inspire a sufficient amount of fright. We find a lot of things in the hospital, and one of the rooms has a VHS player and a TV that Harry marks on his map, cause we'll need it in a bit. The main puzzle that we need to solve here is that of the plates. We collect four plates from around the hospital, the plate of Turtle, Hatter, Queen, and Cat. Collecting these sends us all around the hospital's three floors and basement. We distract a tentacle monster with a blood pack and gain a new weapon, the hammer, which is much better at disposing of enemies than the pipe. The actual puzzle we have to solve is actually pretty interesting. There's already four plates on the wall and they're colored white, orange, purple, and black. The note on the wall is our main clue. Each line corresponds with a color, starting with the white of clouds and ending with the red of blood. Getting through this door allows us access into the basement storeroom. Here, there's a cleverly placed cabinet that can be moved. Behind it is a trap door covered with vines. In the hospital, we can find a bottle of alcohol and a lighter to help us out here. This burns the vines and gives us access to the sub-basement. Down here, Harry finds a strange bed with a picture of a girl beside it, named Alessa. He isn't sure who would be staying down here or why. We find a key and VHS tape that can be played upstairs. It doesn't provide much clarity or information as its contents are mostly distorted. 
Using the key Harry found downstairs on the locked examination room, he enters to find a non-puppeted nurse hidden under a table. Her name is Lisa Garland, and she was hiding out in here away from the monsters. Lisa doesn't seem to know much about what's going on here, and she says that everyone is under strict orders to never enter the basement storeroom. So I really don't know. What did you say was down there? Well, it's... Mm. Damn. My head. What's wrong? Harry? At this point, Harry's head starts pounding and he fades, waking up in the normal hospital. You were too late. It's you. Yes, Dahlia Gillespie. Dahlia shows up again and says that the town is being devoured by darkness. Harry doesn't understand any of this, and that's kind of the point. Like I said, Silent Hill's story is very obscured. It was made that way intentionally to reward those brave enough to scour the game for details. Harry is also a reflection of that. He mirrors our vague and surface-level understanding of the game the first time we play it. The other church in this town, that is your destination. This is beyond my abilities. Only you can stop it now. Have you not seen the crest marked on the ground all over town? So that's what I saw in the schoolyard. What does it mean? It is the mark of Samael. Don't let it be completed. She gives us a key to the antique shop and tells us to head to the other church in this town. Samael is another Toyama occult reference, an archangel originating in the Talmud. He is sometimes confused with Satan, but has been shown to do both good and evil. I really like the research that went into this game with religious and occult references. It makes the game feel more genuine rather than just creating hordes of new names. It cements the game a little more in reality rather than being mostly a surrealist tale. Heading to the antique shop, Harry finds another cabinet concealing an entrance. As he goes to enter, Sybil arrives. She says that she saw Cheryl on Bachman Road, heading towards the lake. It wasn't like she ran off, exactly. There was no place for her to go. The road has been obliterated. What? So then Cheryl... It was like she was walking on thin air. Harry tells Sybil about Dahlia, and she believes it has to do with the drug trafficking that the police force has been trying to stop in Silent Hill for some time. Harry asks Sybil about the alternate place that he's been going to, but she hasn't been experiencing the same thing. Harry thinks that it's some type of dream, but he's not sure, and honestly, at this point, we aren't even sure. Harry heads into the secret passage and finds an altar, the second church that Dahlia was speaking of. There's a picture of a winged beast above it, and when Harry goes to leave the room, the altar lights itself. Sybil goes in to save him, but Harry wakes back up in the alternate hospital with Lisa. Lisa, do you know a woman named Dahlia Gillespie? Oh yeah, that crazy Gillespie lady. She's kind of famous around here. She never sees anybody, so I don't know that much about her. But I heard her kid died in a fire, and supposedly she's been crazy ever since. Well, she says the town is being devoured by the darkness. Before Silent Hill became a resort town, it was quiet and everyone followed an occult religion. But she says she hasn't heard about that in years. The last time was when people developing the town died in accidents, most of the town folk thinking it was a curse. Lisa clams up and the dream state ends. Harry wakes back up in the antique shop, wondering if this was another dream, and if he just had a car accident and he's laying in a hospital somewhere. He's completely confused and questioning reality at this point. We need to get to the lake to look for Cheryl, but the road to it is blocked. 
Our next destination is the town center, but outside, the town that we know has changed to an alternate version of itself. The roads are now made of the rusty grating that we've seen in the Otherworld school, and its pitch black skies loom over us. In the town center, all of the TVs turn on and show the mark we've been seeing around town. Harry falls through some grating into an area covered with sand. This is our second boss fight, the Twin Feeler. Sitting on the edge of the arena is a hunting rifle, a new weapon, but its application is more long-ranged, so it won't be useful yet. The shotgun does a lot of damage to the larva when he pops up to shoot clouds of poison at us. Getting close to him and dodging his poison is pretty simple, and he runs away after pumping some shells into him. Now that the surrounding town has changed, some areas are open to us that weren't before, but we need to head back to the hospital to see if Lisa can get us to the lake. Lisa, can you tell me how to get to the lake? The lake? You take Bachman Road. The road's blocked. Well, that's the only way out there. Are you sure? There's gotta be another way. Wait! I just remembered something! What? There's a waterworks over by my old elementary school. It's been abandoned for years. There's an underground tunnel out there used for inspections or something. Lisa doesn't want us to leave her alone in the hospital, but she says she feels like she can't leave. Now, I know you're probably wondering why the voice acting is so... bad for Silent Hill. Supposedly, there's a reason for this. I couldn't find the specific reference, but a lot of people claim that the voice acting is stunted and oddly delivered on purpose. The team wanted the game to feel dreamlike, and the line delivery adds to that. I'm not entirely sure if this is true, but I do know that the acting adds to the unnerving and unsettling sense. Lisa decides to stay and Harry heads out, but outside of the hospital, the only path open is to the roof of the building across the street. We're going to finish our boss fight with the Twin Feeler, but it's changed into a full-fledged moth, the Float Stinger. It shoots acid at us and will try to sting Harry with its stinger. It's not a very difficult boss fight with the hunting rifle. The hunting rifle is more of a long-range damage weapon, and it's very useful here. The best strategy I found was to run back and forth on the rooftop to get distance between the boss and fire off a couple rounds before dodging its next attack and running to the other side. The moth is defeated, and we're back in the normal Silent Hill, free to run back to the sewers. The entrance is right next to the elementary school. Once he finds it, Harry heads down the ladder. For some reason, this was the most terrifying environment in the game for me. It's dark, and the sound design is on full tilt down here. There's constantly groans and creepy noises off in the distance. You're not sure what is a sound effect made to give rise to fear in your stomach, or what's an actual monster. The new enemies down here, the Hanged Scratchers, are also terrifying and make similarly unsettling noises. They're not particularly hard to beat, and even at this point in the game, I was quite well off on ammo. I still ran away from them because I wanted to be out of the sewers as fast as I could. Exiting on the other side finds us finally in the resort area of the town that we've heard talked about so much. Like I said before, Silent Hill has four main endings. This part of the game is where you determine whether you get the good or the bad ending of the game. There's an optional side quest here that you can complete, which we will. We find Dr. Kaufman in a bar being attacked by one of the town's monsters. We save him and he asks us if we know a girl named Alessa before leaving. We find his key on the ground and a door code that lets us into the Indian Runner General Store down the block. Inside, we find some evidence of drug peddling going on in the store, and some drugs themselves in a safe. We find another code that will get us into the motel down the street. Inside this office is a motorcycle which is broken down. 
Using the Kaufman key to access one of the rooms, we can find the key and use it to get into the gas tank of the motorcycle, where another vial of the liquid we found in the hospital is being stored. Upon finding it, Kaufman arrives and takes the bottle. He says it's none of our business and we should be finding a way out of here, before threatening Harry. Harry thinks he must be involved in the local drug racket and decides to leave. Completing that side quest will gain us the good ending for the game, and Harry heads towards the lighthouse. On his way, the town changes into its alternate otherworld version before our eyes. Harry thinks it feels different. Instead of shifting from reality to a nightmare, it feels like the reality is becoming the nightmare. Harry finds a houseboat and Sybil is on it. What is with this town? This may sound really off the wall, but listen to me. You've got to believe me. I haven't gone crazy and I'm not fooling around. At first, I thought I was losing my mind. Now I know I'm not. It's not me. This whole town. It's being invaded by the other world. By a world of someone's nightmarish delusions come to life. Just then, she shows up. She says the demon will swallow the land and that the town will be sealed to the abyss by the mark of Samael. When it is completed, all is lost. Even in daytime, darkness will cover the sun. The dead will walk and martyrs will burn in the fires of hell. Everyone will die. Harry has to go to the lighthouse and Sybil decides to go to the amusement park, the two last places that are to be sealed. The monsters outside have now transformed into stronger versions of themselves. The Air Screamer is now the Night Flutter, and the Groaners are now Wormheads. They are similar, but entirely warped, their heads transformed into a mass of worms. The lighthouse isn't far, and Harry climbs the stairs to find the girl again, just before she disappears. We see a glowing bright seal covering the top of the building. Her work has been done and Harry is too late. He doesn't find Sybil back in the houseboat, so we have to head to the amusement park to find her. Harry heads through the sewers to get there and the amusement park is peak spooky environment. We don't have a map to lead us around. There's monsters everywhere and it's dark, like really dark. There's no ground, everything covered in that rusted steel grating. Harry arrives at the merry-go-round and finds Sybil passed out. She quickly gets up and starts shooting at us. She's become possessed by something. This is the second event that determines the ending we receive. We use the bottle of liquid that we grabbed back in the hospital. Throwing it on Sybil will cause the parasite that's inside of her to squirm out. We've saved her, and this will give us the plus ending of whichever path we chose earlier. You can actually fight Sybil here, which will give us the normal ending, either bad or good. If we do that, Sybil dies and doesn't help us moving forward. The boss fight against her is pretty difficult as well. She does a lot of damage, and dodging her shots isn't easy. It's probably just better off to save Sybil in the end. Harry talks to Sybil and reveals a big turn to the audience. Why her? I'm not sure myself. But you know, Cheryl isn't my biological daughter. I actually haven't told her yet. She probably already knows anyway, though. We found her abandoned on the side of the highway. Nobody knew where she came from. The imagery presented during this reveal is fantastic, just the rolling text over top of the dimly lit, moving merry-go-round. At this point, the girl that we've been chasing shows up. Harry asks her to let Cheryl go, but she pushes him back with a telekinetic blast. She has some sort of force field around her that stops Harry, and at that moment, the flowros starts glowing and rises into the air. Its forces disrupt the girl's force field, and she's incapacitated. Dahlia shows up and refers to the girl as Alessa, and we realize that she is Dahlia's daughter. Dahlia Gillespie? Where's Cheryl? Where is she? 
Alaska. This is the end of your little game. Mama? Could she be? You've been a ghastly little pest, haven't you, Alessa? We also realize quickly that Dahlia knows a lot more than she's been letting on. Dahlia takes Alessa, and suddenly, we're back in the hospital with Lisa. Lisa? What happened? Where's Alessa and Dahlia? Harry, listen. Something you said before has been bothering me. I just can't get it out of my head. What is it, Lisa? So I went to look in the basement. Even though I was scared as hell. Like you said, there were these creepy rooms. But nothing really unusual down there. But while I was down there, I got this weird feeling. Like I'd been there before. Like something happened there, but I can't quite remember somehow. Lisa is growing even more scared now. Then that fear turns to anger and she rushes off. A sound is coming from the basement and Harry goes to investigate, but the layout has changed and the elevator is directly in front of us. We're not in the alternate hospital now. We're in Nowhere, the final area of the game. This area is so well done, it's just as atmospheric and unsettling as the other areas because it's an amalgamation of all of them. Hospital corridors will lead to antique shops or schoolrooms. It's so well done and just feels like a surrealist nightmare. Making our way through the intricate hallways is difficult, but our ultimate goal is to find five relics that we need to progress. We solve a puzzle that has names on a slate. The word we need to find is made up of the first letter of these names when ranked by age. Eventually, we find Lisa again. What's the matter with you? I get it now. Why well, I'm still alive even though everyone else is dead. I'm not the only one who's still walking around. I'm the same as them. I just hadn't noticed it before. Lisa. Stay by me, Harry. Please. I'm so scared. Help me. Save me from them. Please. Here, we get one of the most well-done scenes in the entire game. Both terrifying and tragic at the same time. It's hauntingly beautiful. Lisa was never like us the whole time. She was always one of them. This reveal coupled with the melancholy synth tune behind it is just fantastic. Lisa's diary is on the ground upon re-entering the room. She was taking care of a burn patient that made her uncomfortable. The room was filled with insects and she couldn't stop vomiting. The last words she wrote were, help me. This FMV is really the best example of the great work that Sato did with these renders. They are incredibly impressive for 1999, and you can see the level of detail in the blood trickling down to the eye, and the eye reacting. It's wonderfully done, and just goes to show how far ahead this game was at the time. The next puzzle is an astrology-based one. This one is interesting because you're given four zodiac signs that have numbers attached to them and need to find the numbers for the ones at the end of the room. Automatically, I thought these must have corresponded with the months they're associated with, but that didn't fit. After a while of fuddling around, you realize that these are the number of appendages each figure has. 
It's a simple solution that's right in front of you, but takes some thinking to notice it. This gives us the Stone of Time, which we use to break the clock in the antique shop room. We get the Key of Haggith, which is most likely a reference to one of the Olympian spirits. These were spirits prominent in some Renaissance ceremonial and ritual magic writings. Each Olympian spirit has a door in this game, and a key that unlocks said door. Haggith, Aratron, Bethor, Phaleg, and Ophiel. They each have a planet associated with them, and range from warlords to transmuters of metals. The only two Olympian spirits with no doors in the game are Oak and Fui. Making our way deeper into nowhere, we find a camera. This is used to solve another puzzle upstairs. The doors to our left and right can be opened by making shapes with the corresponding buttons. These key shapes can only be found when using the camera to take a picture of the paintings on either side. We pick up a ring of contract that can be used to bind the chain on this fridge. Once we pull the dagger out of this fridge, the beast that's inside will try to attack. And if the chain isn't bound, Harry will turn into monster food very quickly. The room with the VHS player returns, and this time we can see everything that's on the tape we had before. It's Lisa, and she's talking about the patient she was overlooking. The patient was a child, revealing it to be, presumably, Alessa. Once we get to the sub-basement, we see shades of Dahlia, Kaufman, and doctors overlooking Alessa on a bed. They're talking about a plan, saying that the soul is lost, the seed lies dormant, lots of cryptic information that we can't make out yet. One thing is clear, they need the other half of the soul they're looking for, and Dahlia wants to use a spell to draw it near. Now we have the five relics that will open the final door. The door is located in Alessa's room. The relics we place are the Ankh, which is a Egyptian representation of life itself. The Amulet of Solomon, which is most likely the Seal of Solomon, which was attributed to King Solomon, a wealthy monarch from religious texts that ruled Israel. It's used in the Key of Solomon, a grimoire notable in mysticism, attributed to the king himself. It's also the predecessor to the Star of David, the modern symbol of Judaism. The Crest of Mercury seems to be referencing the Roman messenger god of the same name, but it's a little confusing. The symbol portrayed seems to be a cross between a caduceus, which Mercury carried in his left hand, and the rod of Asclepius, the predominant symbol of medicine and healthcare. The disc of Ouroboros is a disc picturing a serpent or dragon eating its own tail. This is an iconic depiction of the eternal cycle of life, death, and rebirth, which have their places in Silent Hill. It originated in Egyptian iconography and the Greek magical tradition, and was then later adopted by Gnostics and Hermetics, notably in alchemy. The final relic, the Dagger of Melchior, seems to be a reference to Melchior, one of the three magi who brought gifts to Jesus after his birth. The dagger could be a reference to the fact that the Magi were originally sent by Herod to find Jesus, and Herod would have had him slaughtered. With all of the relics placed in the door, we can enter. Inside, we see Dahlia forcing Alessa to lend her some of her power, but Alessa doesn't want to. We head down the stairs to see Sybil pointing a gun at Dahlia, Alessa by her side, and something sitting in a wheelchair. Freeze! Devil's name? Ugh. Dahlia. Well, well, well. To think you'd make it this far. Where's Cheryl? What have you done to her? What are you talking about? You've seen her many times restored to her former self. No mood for jokes. Don't you see? She's right there. That's absurd. She says she was shocked to see the talisman of Metatron being used. 
Metatron is an archangel that is mentioned briefly in the Talmud, and most notably in Jewish Apocrypha and early Kabbalistic texts. Dahlia says that it was all thanks to Harry, and even though he helped her plan, Alessa still has to go. Alessa has been kept alive, suffering a fate worse than death. Alessa has been trapped in an endless nightmare from which she never awakens. He has been nurtured by that nightmare, waiting for the day to be born. That day has finally come. The time is nigh. Everyone will be released from pain and suffering. Our salvation is at hand. This is the day of reckoning. When all our sorrows will be washed away. When we return to the true paradise. My daughter will be the mother of God. A blinding light appears and obscures Alessa. When she appears, she's a form of white light, just one body left. Kaufman shows up, shoots Dahlia, and tells her that she won't get away with this. He then pulls the bottle of liquid that we found earlier out of his pocket and throws it at Alessa. She squirms, and a being starts to form out of her back. This is the dark god that Dahlia was talking about. It flies into the air, and we have our final boss fight. The music during this part is amazing. Its screeching, shrieking sounds rip through your ears and truly reflect the gravity of this dark god being birthed. The fight is pretty easy at this point. We've accumulated so many healing items and bullets that we can soak all of the boss's attacks and then just heal and unload some hunting rifle bullets into him. Eventually, he's defeated, and the nowhere plane that we're in starts to collapse. The glowing Alessa gives Harry a baby, before he and Cheryl escape the burning place. Lisa crawls from the ground and pulls Kaufman down into the underworld. The last scene we see is Alessa saving Harry and Sybil during the escape, and them running off into the fog of Silent Hill with their new child. When beating the game with this ending, the intro cutscene will see Jody, Harry's wife, being replaced with Sybil. Going back through the game after beating it, you'll be able to find some secret weapons, a katana, a chainsaw, a rock drill, and the hyper blaster. This shows that the game was made for replayability. That was the good plus ending, but what about the other three endings? The good ending requires that we complete the Kaufman side quest, but instead fight Sybil and don't save her. This ending is basically the same, but Sybil isn't around to shoot Dahlia and doesn't leave with Harry in the end. The bad plus ending requires not completing the Kaufman side quest, but saving Sybil. This sees us fighting a mostly similar but different boss battle with the glowing Alessa, since Kaufman was never around to throw the liquid at her. Harry collapses in sorrow after winning the battle, and Sybil comes over to shake him up as they run out of the other world. The bad ending requires us ignoring the Kaufman side quest entirely, and not saving Sybil. This is the same as the bad plus ending, but Harry is not saved by Sybil, and is then shown bleeding unconscious in his car. This suggests that everything that happened were images conjured from his dying brain after his car accident. Harry even wonders this during the events of the game. There's still a bit of debate on which ending is canon. We know for certain that neither of the bad endings are canon due to later games in the series, but the real debate is whether the good or good plus ending is canon. Basically, does Sybil officially survive or not? A lot of people consider Sybil dying to be canon as she doesn't appear in later games. Masahiro Ito has made some vague statements, possibly saying the good ending is canon, 
And Toyama himself has said the game was designed around the good ending being canon, meaning Sybil is dead. But then he later changed his mind and said the good plus ending is the true ending. So it's not really clear, and since it isn't confirmed later, it's honestly up to you to decide. Personally, I like to think Sybil lived, and she just stayed home during the later games. There is a fifth secret joke ending that can be achieved after beating the game once and finding the Channeling Stone, a hidden item that can be used at various points around the town. This will then summon a group of UFOs, and Harry is shot down by the aliens, and they pull him off into their spaceship. The interesting thing about the multiple endings is that first-time players, unless incredibly diligent or using a guide, would probably naturally get the bad ending, as the prerequisites for getting the better endings are easy to miss. This furthers the fact that the true story is hidden underneath and requires diligence and patience to uncover. So what actually happened in Silent Hill? From our first playthrough, it seems that Harry looked to find his daughter found a cult, a girl named Alessa was placed in a ritual by her mother, and Harry and Sybil get a baby. Oh yeah, and Kaufman was peddling drugs. Well, let's go back a little bit, and I can tell you the real story of what happened in Silent Hill. So Silent Hill, truly, underneath, is led by a cult. The cult uses a drug called PTV, made from a flower called White Claudia, to lure in tourists that come to the resort. The cult's main goal is to bring their dark god into this world with an eternal paradise. Alessa Gillespie was a young girl who was impregnated with the seed of the cult's dark god. Alessa's innate powers, coupled with the stress that her mother is putting on, cause the boiler in her house to explode. This is the fire that Lisa references in the hospital, during which Alessa is nearly killed. The cult decides to keep Alessa alive until she's ready to give birth. Dr. Kaufman is the leader of the town's drug ring, distributing PTV around. Lisa Garland was assigned to attend to Alessa in the sub-basement of the hospital. This is who she's referencing during the VHS tape. Alessa splits her soul in half while in the hospital to protect herself. The other half of her soul is split into a human child, who Harry and Jody Mason find on the side of the road. This is Cheryl Mason. The cult needs to reunite the two halves of Alessa's soul and draw Cheryl towards Silent Hill with the use of a spell. When Cheryl and Harry arrive in Silent Hill, she is drawn toward her other half and she also becomes closer to her true aspect, that of Alessa. This is why we see Cheryl turn into Alessa early in the game. Alessa tries to counteract the demons by spreading the seal of Metatron. This is counter to what Dahlia tells Harry a good thing. It backfires, though, and begins projecting her nightmare world on the town. Dahlia begins using Harry to try and stop Alessa. If Alessa succeeds, then Dahlia's plan is thwarted, and they will not be able to give birth to the Dark God. The Seal of Metatron is actually made to ward off evil. If you look at both influences, this is clear. Samael is mostly an evil figure, and the name of a figure sometimes representing death. Metatron is an archangel, generally described as one of the most powerful. The Flauros breaks Alessa's protection, and at this point, Harry doesn't realize what he's doing. This allows Dahlia to grab Alessa and take her to her other half, reuniting the soul and giving birth to the Dark God. Harry and Sybil arrive before the ritual is complete, and Kaufman shows up, throwing the Aglaufidus at Alessa. This is an herb mentioned in the Simon Necronomicon. It's supposed to ward off demons and witchcraft. This drives the god out of Alessa, and Harry does battle with it. Alessa survives briefly and thanks Harry by giving him a new child. Dahlia is killed by the dark god when dying, and Kaufman is pulled down into another world by Lisa. This story is only found when looking deep into the game, at the memos the game hides, reading into every piece of dialogue and looking at events closely. This is one of the biggest reasons that this game is truly special, because not to sound cliche, but games don't really do this anymore. It would be such a big risk to hide most of the story from the average player, leaving them confused and forcing them to go back and pay close attention to every detail just to find out what happened. 
The story itself is also amazing. Dahlia is a perfect example of this. Throughout the game, she is painted as the archetypal oracle character, someone that's probably crazy but might have some divine knowledge or foresight and helps us along the way. Only near the end do we learn that Harry has become her pawn. By shirking her off as the kooky old woman in town, Harry falls right into her trap. It's done so well and the entire story is recontextualized upon completion. Like I said before, Harry is a perfect character for us to play in this incredibly foreign atmosphere. He knows nothing and we know nothing. He is confused and we are confused. He has just barely enough knowledge for us to identify with him and he's having the same doubts and fears that we are through the entire game. What's going on? Is this a dream? Where are we? Because the town is a reflection of Alessa's nightmare, it's also a reflection of herself, her fears. The school is a nightmare because she was bullied there, made to feel different. We see her personality in her room, bugs on the wall show up as the moth and larva bosses. The titles of her books even reflect some of the monsters in town. This entire game is a masterclass in storytelling, and it just works so well. In March of 2001, Konami released a GBA port of Silent Hill called Silent Hill Play Novel. It was a visual novel adaptation of the original game and featured mostly scrolling text against still images from the game. Fans have created PC ports and fan translations to bring this game to the West, but it was only officially released in Japan. It really wasn't a great experience or one that I would recommend. It really removes about 90% of what made Silent Hill interesting in the first place. You can make choices at certain points in the game, but Silent Hill was really about the atmosphere, and most of that is gone here. There were a couple extra scenarios that could be played, like Sybil and a boy named Andy, but I don't really think these are worth your time. They're nothing like the original experience and are just an interesting side note. This was the first time I played the original Silent Hill since I was a kid. I was really worried that the game wouldn't hold up, that it was too late, and I would have to struggle through outdated mechanics just to get to the real meat underneath. But Silent Hill is still a masterpiece over 20 years later. The mechanics, music, atmosphere, and story are all timeless. It's a masterwork and every little piece and detail feels purposefully set. This game is lean, there's no fat, no extra, just meat. Its powerful environment terrifies and unsettles. Its anxiety-inducing combat gets the heart pumping, and most importantly, its characters and story intrigues. Silent Hill forever changed the horror landscape and would influence horror games for years to come. Silent Hill met great critical reviews, most praising Team Silent's clever usage of the hardware's incapabilities. The voice acting was criticized by journalists, though, pointing out the long pauses between lines of dialogue. The game would go on to sell over 2 million copies, and as much praise as I just gave this game, it was only the beginning of the golden age of Silent Hill.